February 2014, Geneva, UN Human Rights Council. Three authors sit down to present a report, and as they deliver their findings, sentence by sentence, they shock the world. The chair of the commission declared jarring similarities to Nazi Germany. The special rapporteur called the human rights violations the worst in the whole world. North Korea has been defined by its isolated, military-first hostile relationship with the surrounding world. Ever since the armistice of the Korean War in 1953, the north of the Korean peninsula has found itself increasingly alone. The 50s and 60s would see North Korea lose its fundamental links to China, and Soviet ideologies evolve as North Korea doubled down. The 70s would see South Korea economically evolve as North Korea stagnated. As the Soviet Union fell, North Korea's economy would fall, famine would follow, and the self-declared independent socialist state was truly alone. There have been various documents and reports that have exposed North Korea's brutal past, from human rights abuses and political repression to public executions and forced abortions. Join us as we take a look inside possibly the worst abuser of human rights on the planet, the North Korean government. Welcome to History on Fleet. A report to shock the world. North Korea has been an isolated nation for some time. The isolation came into increasing effect with the end of the Cold War and China's newfound openness to the West in the 1980s. What is considered the biggest accelerant of the isolation was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, which offset a famine in North Korea that lasted nearly five years long. International eyes on the independent socialist state have predominantly been from afar, and accounts from those who have lived in the country have been dearly sought. The United Nations has published several reports documenting human rights abuses in North Korea. The most notable of these is the 2014 report by the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea. The details inside were truly shocking. At its opening, the report would state that crimes against humanity were widespread and implemented through policies set at the very head of the regime. A solid 400-page report compiled documents and reports from witnesses and first-hand victims to paint a haunting picture. The commission behind the report stated the scale of human rights violations in North Korea is incomparable to any modern state anywhere. Among the most chilling details are the treatment of political prisoners. First-hand accounts describe people catching mice and snakes to feed starving babies. Inside the report is a picture of anything between 80,000 to 120,000 political prisoners being deliberately starved when not facing physical punishment or even murder. Disturbingly, those who flee the oppressive and dangerous regime are subject to a landscape that offers no more safety. The DPRK's restriction of movement has resulted in women and girls being subject to sex work and human trafficking outside of the country. Yet those who stay are by no means avoiding a level of violence only found elsewhere. Surveillance inside the DPRK is a pervasive menace that subjects the general public to live in fear and subservience to the regime. Disappearing into a political prison camp or public executions are a reality and are made to feel wary of. Voices of those who fled for survival So much of life inside North Korea's clandestine regime has been made public and understood through the testimony of defectors. Defectors give accounts of such repression, it's scarcely imaginable to contemporary Western mindsets, where liberty is a given and freedom of choice is to be debated only over its details, not its existence. Defectors paint a picture of dead bodies being found in the streets with ease, the majority of which had perished through hunger. Many speak of friends and their parents becoming beggars just to make food. Accounts of people attempting to jump on the food train from Russia but endangering their lives in the process. Success in North Korea sounds like a double-edged sword, according to defectors. One needs success in some field or business to stave off the endemic of malnutrition and hunger. However, if a business is to earn over a certain amount of wealth, owners can face execution or a total confiscation of their property. Everyday life is a potential for persecution of the ordinary citizen. Defectors have stated how watching a South Korean television drama can lead to years in prison on the grounds it is a hostile act. It was clearly a strain of punishment upon the North Korean population that commonly uses forced labor camps to this day. Across defector testimony, the two most common strands are from North Korean women stating they faced sexual violence during defection. The other recurring strand in testimony is the feeling of longing, remorse, and regret for the family these defectors had to leave behind in the hope of surviving. The view from the highest point. There is likely no greater symbolism of North Korea's international isolation than of the satellite images used to survey from the outside. Perhaps the most startling of images is the satellite photography taken of North Korea at night. It is simply pitch black. The lights of neighboring South Korea shine brightly. North Korea is entirely dark, 
only identifiable when outlined on the photograph after. Images captured by NASA over the Korean Peninsula give a tragic indicator of the regime's underpowered stagnation, as South Korea glows and North Korea shows but one orb over Pyongyang and some smaller lights of surrounding fishing boats along its coast. During the day, however, further realities of the regime have been revealed to a wider international community. Amnesty International commissioned satellite images of the nation in 2013, revealing the extent of political prison camps designed for its own population. Over the decades, that knowledge of political repression is a reality for the North Korean people. The international community has made ever louder calls for them to close their prison camps. The satellite images show quite the opposite. Known as Kwon Sai Lo, the camps across North and South Hamyong province appear to have expanded and developed in satellite images while the elite family compounds, Tae Dong Gong Brewery and Ostrich Farms all appear visible from the captured images. It is the Kwan Sai Lo where human rights abuses run rampant and show no signs of abating. North Korea on North Korea The very veins of an isolated and oppressive state are in its ability to keep its general public strictly adherent to a narrow, epistemic diet. This means the state exposes the people only to what they want them to see. Propaganda efforts of the DPRK are as widespread as they are conveniently avoiding the brutal realities and oppressions for which the state is responsible. Thematically, the leading strand of all North Korean propaganda is Juche, a radicalized offshoot of Marxist-Leninism, calling on a total self-reliant, independent state. That being said, since Kim Jong-il's position as supreme leader in 1994, the propaganda has increasingly been steeped in the cult of personality of the country's leader. Propaganda covering other nations has been typically hostile. Until 2018, June 25th was Struggle Against U.S. Imperialism Month, where anti-U.S. rallies were held. Americans have been consistently presented as an ungodly race, with whom there is no possibility of cordial relationships. Much of North Korea's foreign hostility is born from the horrors of the Korean War. Japan has also been depicted as a clear and present danger that should never be demilitarized in North Korean eyes. During the famine of the 1990s that claimed as many as 3.5 million lives, the government propaganda would describe it as a food shortage that was thanks to bad weather and somehow better than the world outside North Korea. This propaganda went as far as ascribing non-food substitutes, including sawdust. Posters depict appropriate clothing for everyday life, military power, and some projection of a utopian society. Among the most curious propaganda practices is the leafleting of the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Dropped across the zone in balloons, the leaflets denigrate the South Korean government whilst singing the praises of the DPRK. In a more nightmarish instance of propaganda, an entire village uninhabited since the 1950s stands in the North Korean half of the DMZ, called Ki Jong Dong. This Potemkin village is purposed to lure South Korean defectors, but in reality is used to house North Korean soldiers. The pen is mightier than the indoctrination. Literature and print have often been a powerful way to gain insight into oft-closed and hidden subject matters. The realities of living in North Korea are no different. Several books and memoirs have been brought to print that have illuminated the darkened picture of the DPRK. Among the most incredible of these works is The Invitation Only Zone by Robert S. Boyton. This book covered the astonishing practice of North Korea abducting everyday civilians from beaches in Japan. What exactly drove the North Koreans to do this isn't clear. The only identifiable action these Japanese people were taken for was teaching turns of phrase to North Korean spies. Supposedly an urban myth, Kim Jong-il would admit to the abductions in 2002, causing understandable outrage in Japan. Barbara Demick's book, Nothing to Envy, gives a sobering account of the realities of living through the North Korean famine in the 1990s. In her book, she interviews 12 defectors who had left the region of Chongjin, in Chongjing, the gravity of decline and mass starvation set in, leaving the place a once-populated graveyard, when it had previously been a built-up site of national industry. As much as anything, the book brings a brilliant account of the everyday normalcy of North Korean people having to face and struggle with an earth-shattering event of national famine. Arguably the most powerful book on the subject matter comes from one-time North Korean propagandist Jong Jin-sun. His memoir, Dear Leader, covers his time as North Korea's poet laureate, under the leadership of Kim Jong-il before he defected in 2004. He covers incredible insider details of the regime's power structures, including being made a member of the untouchable elite, he admitted. In the other revelations, he covers a mind-blowing operation called the Seed Bearing Program. The design was that attractive North Korean female agents would go abroad and bear children with men of other nationalities and races. 
The long-term goal was to breed these children into North Korean spies, who looked different despite a profound ideological indoctrination. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.